right, well, welcome. Open your Bibles to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter, we're going to only cover two verses tonight, verses 7 and 8, and how to occupy until the Lord returns. Let's pray, and we'll begin our time together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time to be together with these sisters in Christ. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fellowship that we have in Christ. I thank you that we know one day you will return, that you will come and take us home, and we are looking forward to that. We have no idea. We know your word says, I has not seen nor ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. So we can't even imagine. We can only imagine, but we really can't. We don't know. And so we look forward to that time, but Lord, for now, you have us here in this crazy world, and we know that you want us to occupy until you come. You have things that we need to be doing. And so I pray as we look into these few verses tonight in First Peter that we would make sure that we are uh, doing the things that you have asked us to do until you return to take us home. And so, Father, I pray that you'll give us grace tonight and alertness as we delve into this text and that we would apply it to our hearts and we would let the spirit convict or convince or whatever work he needs to do and lord that we would not grieve or quench him and i pray this in christ's name amen well i have some very vivid memories of growing up in a baptist minister's home especially a minister who loved to talk about Bible prophecy. My dad taught more on Bible prophecy, I think, than any other thing in Scripture. And I remember specifically one Sunday night coming out of church, and my dad pastored over around 15th and Memorial, and I uh, remember coming out of church, and it was kind of one of those nights where the sky was really strange looking, and I was probably, I don't know, maybe fifth grade or something, and I was standing next to an older lady named Genevieve Mayer. She had gray hair. She always put it in a bun, and she looked up in the sky, and she said, wouldn't it be great if he came tonight? And I looked at her, and I, in my heart, I just, I, I just wanted to sink, and I thought, oh, no, it, it'd be horrible if he came tonight. And I didn't tell her that, but in my mind, I was thinking, wait a minute, I haven't even gotten to high school yet, and I haven't even had a boyfriend and had babies, and no, it'd be awful if he came tonight. And I have that memory. Graduated from high school, went off to Moody Bible Institute, and I remember specifically another memory of sitting in the cafeteria with a man named Doug Heck that I was dating, and he brought up the subject of the Lord's return, and I started to cry, and he said, what's the matter with you? And I said, I, I don't want you talking about this. I don't want you talking about the Lord's return. I said, that's all I heard growing up as a a girl in a Baptist minister's home. My dad loved Bible prophecy, and I just don't want to talk about it. And he thought it was so strange. And he said, Susan, this is the believer's blessed hope. Why don't you want to talk about it? And little did I realize that I was fearful because I did not know the one who was going to return. I was self-deceived. I was one I was self-deceived into thinking I was one of his children. And so Doug and I got married, we had children, and life went on, and so did my fears regarding the Lord's return. And it wasn't until I was about the age of 30, and most of you know my testimony, that the Lord plucked me from the pit, showed me my wretched self, and I repented of my sin and committed my life to the Lordship of Christ. And it was such an encouragement to me, as soon as the Lord saved me, I began to develop a hunger for his word. And I remember specifically, Doug was, we moved from Oklahoma back to, or not back to, but to California, and he was in seminary, and so I would spend my days studying and reading, and the kids were in school. And I remember I was studying 1 John while I was memorizing 1 John, and I came to chapter 4 where it says, There is no fear in love, because perfect love casts out fear. Fear has punishment. And I thought, what does that mean? And so I looked at it and was studying, and I thought, oh, yeah. In the context, John is talking about the judgment to come. And when we stand before him, we will have no fear in judgment. Why? Because perfect love, Christ, cast out fear. And I thought, oh, that's why you, Susan Joy Heck, 
were terrified all those years of the Lord's return because you did not know the one who was coming to take his children home. And so it was a joy to my heart. I finally realized all those years why I was so terrified, why I was so scared when people would bring up the Lord's return. Literally, my knees would start shaking. It was because I didn't know the Lord. I did not know the one who was coming. In fact, today you can talk to me about the rapture or the Lord's return or however you want to call it, all you want, and I will not cry. My knees will not shake, but I'll probably say, even so, come, Lord Jesus, any day now. And uh, so I'm not scared. The Lord's coming. It is a theme that runs throughout much of the New Testament and now here in 1 Peter. So let's hear what Peter has to say about this event. 1 Peter 4, 7 to 8. He says this, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for each other. For love will cover a multitude of sins. So Peter writes about what we are to do while we wait for the Lord to return. Peter says, because the end is near, then there are certain things that we are to be about. In fact, we are to occupy in four ways. And we're going to see three of these tonight. And then next week, we'll visit the fourth one because it's going to be uh, using our spiritual gifts. And I want to go into what all the spiritual gifts are in the scripture. Because a lot of you have some confusion about the spiritual gifts. You don't know what your spiritual gifts are but you need to know what they are. You need to be using them for the glory of God. And so next week, we're going to get into the fourth thing where he talks about using our spiritual gifts while we wait for the Lord's return. But tonight, we're going to look at three out of the four. And ladies, those ways are not eat, drink, do drugs, and party on. <laughs> That's what we did before salvation. Remember, we talked about that last time. Those were our sins from the past. And so we're going to look, as I said, three of them tonight. Now, speaking of the last time when we were together, we started chapter 4. We looked at the believer's present life. Remember, we're to suffer for Christ. We're also to live for him. We also looked at our former life, and we saw our former life was filled with all types of wickedness. And then lastly, we looked at our future life. It is judgment to come, but we are going to have life eternal with the Lord throughout all eternity. And so Peter now reminds the readers that the end is going to come, and we must be ready. Look at verse 7. He says, but the end of all things is at hand. The word but here introduces a new train of thought, which is suggested by the mention of judgment that we just had in the verse 6. If you'll look, we're going to be judged according to men in the flesh. And so when we talk about judgment, what does that remind us of? If I say the word judgment, what does it remind you of? The Lord's coming, right? The Lord is going to come. And so Peter is reminding his readers that judgment is not far off. By the words, the end is at hand. In fact, he says, of all things, the end is at hand. Now, the word end is a word that means a goal achieved, a consummation. But the question comes up then, what is the goal achieved? What is he talking about? Well, when we consider what he's already been talking about through all of 1 Peter, we can understand that he's talking about the last days. He's already talked about the living hope in chapter 1, the last time in chapter 1, verse 5, the appearing of Jesus Christ in chapter 1, verse 7, the revelation of Jesus Christ in chapter 1, verse 13, and we talked last time about the judgment of the living and the dead in verses 5 and 6. And so the end of all things is what? The Christian's hope, the Lord's return. In fact, the word translated of all things is in the emphatic position in the Greek, so it would read like this. Of all things, the end is at hand. It's near. It's approaching. In fact, it's similar to what we saw last week. He's ready to judge the living and the dead. Or what Paul says in his epistle in Romans 13. And know this, the time, it's time to awake out of your sleep. Why? For now is our salvation nearer than we ever believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The Lord is coming. Or as Paul says in Philippians 4, 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. Why? Why should I let my gentleness be known to all men? Paul says, because the Lord's at hand. The Lord is coming. 
Or as James writes to the persecuted Christians in James chapter 5, and he tells them to be patient as they go through this suffering and persecution. Why? He says, because the judge is coming. The Lord is coming. In fact, the Greek there in James is, he's at the door, ready, waiting to push the doors open to come and get his children. He's just waiting for the father to tell him, it's time to go get your children. Uh, there's other passages also that deal with this. The Lord is coming. And ladies, the Christians in the early church, you know they expected the Lord to come at any time. Remember in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended into heaven, and these uh, two men were standing by, and they said, you men of Galilee, this same Jesus that was taken up into heaven will come in like manner just as you have seen him go into heaven. And so the early church, the biblical church, they thought the Lord would return at any time. And even during the Reformation, believers thought the end was near. In fact, today, if you will talk to believers uh, because of the, what's been going on in our nation for the last couple of years, most believers are saying, uh, the end surely has to be at hand, right? I mean, everything is being set up for the end time. Surely the Lord is coming, right? And so even unbelievers. I have some family members that are unbelievers, and they're starting to think about our upbringing a little bit, and all those prophetic books my dad taught, and they go, I'm starting to th see those things that daddy used to teach us, and I'm like, yeah, and you better, you better get saved quick, right? But uh, just because he hasn't come yet doesn't mean he won't. In fact, uh, Second Peter, in, in, sec in Peter's second epistle, he says in the last days there's going to be scoffers saying, <laughs> where's the promise of his coming? Where is that promise of his coming? And they go on to say, since the fathers fell asleep, everything is the same. And Peter warns them and reminds them. He said, beloved, don't forget this one thing. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count long slackness, but he's long-suffering not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In fact, Peter goes on to write in his second epistle, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will burn with fervent heat and the, everything in the earth will be burned up. And then he goes on to say, seeing this is gonna happen, what manner ought you to be in all holy living and godliness. So ladies, we're going to see that. People are going to say, I thought the Lord was going to come. He's not going to come. He's been saying, you know, we've been th saying this for 2,000 years. And Peter talks about that in 2 Peter. The Lord will come. But ladies, we have to remember, time is nothing to God. He is eternal. The hours pass by neither fast or slowly to him. He is not slack or tardy concerning his promise. He will come when the time is appointed. In fact, we know from Matthew 24, no one knows the day or the hour, right? Only the Father. No one knows. You don't know. So if anybody tries to tell you the Lord's going to come, you know, tomorrow, he's not going to come tomorrow. Nobody knows. Not even the Son. Only the Father. And so notice here, Peter does not even set a date. He just says he is coming. Ladies, regardless of when it will be, we must be ready at all times because we do not know when he will come. But we do know this, with every passing day, the coming of the Lord is drawing near, right? We're one day closer today than we were yesterday, and tomorrow will be one day closer. So what should we be doing, and what should these readers be doing in light of the Lord's return? Should we eat, get drunk, party on, no. Because the end is near, Peter says, first of all, here's the first thing we should be doing. We should be serious or sober-minded, your translation might say. Ladies, this is the first thing that you should be doing while you're waiting for the Lord to return. Now think very carefully with me. If you really thought the Lord was coming before Bible study ends tonight, would you sober up? Did you get a little serious? If you really thought the Lord was going to return, or even tomorrow, that he was going to come tomorrow, would you sober up? And yet, ladies, we are to live as though it could be tonight, right? 
It could be tomorrow. In fact, the word serious or sober is a word that we've had before. We had it in 1 Peter 1, 13. And it means we are to have a sound mind. We are to be clear-headed. Remember, we're to gird up the loins of our mind. Now, think very carefully. Think critically. Think biblically. Remember what these Christians were going through, right? So the temptation for many of these readers would be what? To have all kinds of fears, all kinds of worries. And ladies, when you're fearful, when you're worried, you know what happens? You make hasty and wrong decisions. And so Peter says, you need to have sobriety of mind. You need to be sober. You need to be serious. Don't dull your mind with drink, as he brought out last week. And I would add in our culture, I have to say this, don't dull your mind with drugs. Ladies, we are living in an age that has a drug addiction, whether it's illegal or legal. Uh, we are far from being sober-minded. Um, and again, Peter's not the only one who reminds us of the seriousness of being sober-minded as we wait for the Lord's return. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. Notice what Paul writes here. He says, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know that perfectly the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, you're not in darkness, so that this day will overtake you as a thief. You are sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night or of darkness. Notice what he says. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch, be sober. For those who sleep, sleep in the night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul also writes, you don't have to turn there, in Titus 2, he says, we should deny ungodly and worldly lusts, live soberly, righteously, godly, looking for that blessed hope, the great appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ladies, we could go through many passages that in, in correlation with the Lord's return tell us we better be sober-minded. We better have a clear head. In fact, this is certainly in contrast to those wild party sins that they used to be involved in, as we saw last time. Ladies, we must have our wits about it, us. In fact, it amazes me when I see more and more people turning to drugs and alcohol to alleviate their fears and their worries. And we've seen a big increase just this last year. People cannot face the reality of death. And so, in fact, some of them can't face the reality of life. And so they turn to numbing drugs. But for the Christian ladies, we have a different place to turn, right? We have the word of God. We have one another. We have the dear Holy Spirit. We have prayer. In fact, prayer is the second thing we should be about in light of the Lord's return. Notice what Peter writes. He says, we are to be watchful in our prayers. This is the second thing we must do in light of Jesus' return. And again, this is not the first time that Peter has talked about prayer. Uh, remember in chapter 1, verse 17, he says, if you call on the Father, in chapter 2, verse 4, he said, coming to him as a living stone. In chapter 3, verse 7, I'm sure the verse you all went home and told your husband to memorize was that his prayers would be hindered if he didn't live with you in an understanding way. And so Peter talked about prayer there. And in chapter 3, verse 12, remember he said, the, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are listening to their prayers. And so Peter's already been talking about prayer several times throughout his epistle but here he says we are to watch unto prayer what does this mean well the word watch means to abstain from wine to be sober to be calm and collected in spirit so that you can pray so it's a little bit different be calm in your spirit be collected be sober watch in order that you can pray. Ladies, if you're drugged or drunk, more than likely you're not apt to pray. So what? We need to be sober so we can pray. You know, the temptation, especially for these readers, would be to drown their sorrow in wine. But instead, what? Peter says, turn to prayer. And again, we see this even in our culture today. 
Instead of our nation right now repenting before a holy God, do you know what our nation is doing? They're becoming more engrossed in evil. And doctors are prescribing psychotropic drugs for strange reasons in our day. And in my opinion, they should be held accountable for that. Uh, I've heard of people having psychotropic drugs prescribed for them for high blood pressure, hormonal issues, nothing having to do with depression or anxiety. In fact, I remember when my mother passed away, uh, she was in Russia and she had a heart attack and she died. And I saw her two weeks before she uh, went on this trip and I just noticed some things about her. I said, Mother, are you on some kind of medication other than what you take for your blood pressure? And she said, well, my doctor put me on an antidepressant or anti-anxiety drug for my blood pressure. And I said, Mother, do you know what those things will do to you long term? You know, And uh, I said, they're not good for you. And uh, so anyway, two weeks later, she had a heart attack and died alone in a Russia hospital. And I remember calling my sister, Janet, who had all of her drugs that she took. And I said, could you give me the name of that medication that Mother had just gone on two weeks before that? And she said, sure. And so I looked it up. And guess what one of the side effects could be? Sudden heart problems. She never had a heart problem. And I, so I was trying to tell her, Mother, those drugs, you know, can really do bad things to you. Uh, I remember one time I was counseling a woman, and she told me that her vet put her dog on an antidepressant because the dog was depressed. All dogs look depressed to me, and cats look like demons. So, uh, and, you know, they, they do. They're just selfish. So, anyway, I'm sorry if you have a dog or a cat, but, but I do think that, that do all dogs look depressed to me. They all look sad. So, but... You know, it is. It's crazy how many times doctors will prescribe those things. And I'm sorry for all of you in here that are medical uh, people, but I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. But ladies, people's lives are becoming increasingly difficult because of what? Moral decay. That's what the problem is. And so instead of turning to the Lord, what do they do? They turn to other means to alleviate their problems. But ladies, that should not be for the child of God. Drugs and alcohol dull your mind and keep you from facing reality. In fact, one man says this, temperance promotes wakefulness, both promote prayer. Drink makes you drowsy, and drowsiness prevents prayer. And so Peter says, listen, you need to be sober. The Lord is coming. You need to be sober, and you need to watch so that you can pray. Ladies, the Christian who's always on a tear, whose mind is crowded with fears and worries, cannot do much praying, right? It's almost impossible. And so these believers going through this persecution would need to have their wits about them so that they could be prayerful. Um, ladies, if your minds are confused with dr drink or drugs, then you will be confused when you pray. In fact, I've counseled many women who are on psychotropic drugs. And it's, I will tell you, it's very difficult as a biblical counselor because when they come in for counseling, they're many times so drugged, they're very robotic. And I can't even reach their minds. And many times they'll say, you know, I really want to help you, but until you get off some of these psychotropic drugs, I can't even appeal to your conscience or your mind. And literally, sometimes they are just very robotic. And so it's very, very difficult. You can't reason with them, and you can't get them to think. And, you know, Paul has a similar idea in, in uh, Philippians where he says, we're not to be anxious for anything. We're not to be anxious for anything. But in everything by what? Same thing Peter says, prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And then what happens? The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guards your hearts and your minds. In fact, Paul uses four different Greek words there for prayer. First of all, we're, we're to be thankful. Lord, thank you for this trial. <laughs> thank you for COVID. Thank you for whatever. So I'm to be thankful. But I'm also to supplicate. I'm also to petition as I go through these difficulties in life. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guards our hearts and our minds. And ladies, Peter's writing really from experience. Do you know he failed here? Do you know he failed? He did not watch 
unto prayer, he would know the heartache. Remember when uh, Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane and it says they came to the place of Gethsemane and he took Peter and James and John, they were just a stones cast away and he said, sit here, stay here while I go and pray. And he went and prayed the prayer that we know, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, where he prayed it over and over. Remember, he comes and he finds him sleeping and he specifically says to Peter, Simon, Simon Peter, <laughs> could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not stay awake one hour? And you know what he said to Simon Peter? Watch, same thing Peter's saying right here, watch and to pray. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. He says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians 6, 18, we're to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance. Colossians 4, we are to continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant with thanksgiving. In fact, it's interesting here in 1 Peter that the word for prayer is actually a plural. So Peter is saying prayers, not just prayer, but prayers. Now, he doesn't say what they should be praying for. He doesn't give them prayer requests. But you know, certain things come to my mind as I think about the end coming. I mean, things come to my mind. First of all, prayers of thanksgiving, right? That I've been chosen before the foundation of the world, that I'm not gonna have to go through that awful torment, whatever it's gonna be, wherever, you're, wherever you land in the pre-millennial, post-millennial, all-millennial, I'm not gonna have to go through that judgment. Uh, Thankfulness that I'm not going to have to experience the awful torment of eternal damnation in hell. Uh, we should be thankful that we have a place prepared for us in heaven. Uh, we should be in prayer about living our lives holy until the Lord returns. How do you want me to occupy until you come, Lord? I should be confessing my sins, right? Uh, that I've committed and sins that I've committed against other people. I should be praying for lost loved ones that don't know the Lord, right? We need to be praying for their souls to be saved. Uh, and the list goes on and on, praying for our persecutors, praying that we will be steadfast to the end. I know uh, after Doug's sermon on Sunday, we went out to lunch with a new family in the church, and on the way to the, the lunch, we went Mexican. Uh, <laughs> had to throw that in there. I said, do you ever think about apostasy, that you would apostatize? And he said, yeah, every day. I said, really? He said, well, not every day. And I said, well, you know, I've thought more about it than last year. I guess because so many people are, you know, denying the faith and leaving the faith. And he was talking about that on Sunday. But ladies, we should be praying for that, right? Lord, keep me steadfast to the end, that I will be faithful to the end. Ladies, if we really thought the end was near, that Christ was going to return today, don't you think you'd be more prayerful? <laughs> Do you think you'd be more prayerful? We'd probably be on our knees, right? Never getting up. I think we would be more prayerful. We need to be praying at all times for all things. Well, the third thing we must be about as we wait for our Lord's return is found in verse 8. And he says, Above all these things, have fervent love among yourselves, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Peter says, Above all these things, which means prior or in front of all these things, we are to have love for each other. Now, this love does not mean that love is preeminent over prayer. It just means that love is the heading to all we do. It's kind of like that list in Colossians where, you know, he has all the put-offs and put-ons. And then right at the end, he says, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond or the girdle that binds everything together, all these things that we do. Or it's like the fruit of the Spirit, uh, where Paul writes that out of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. And out of love comes what? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, self-control. Love is the preeminent fruit, and that's what Peter is saying. Uh, in fact, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. The greatest of these is love. If I give my body to be burned and have not love, I'm what? I'm a big fat zero, <laughs> right? And so love is the thing that we pursue and we chase after. Uh, in fact, I was studying 2 Peter yesterday, and that list of virtues, uh, add to your virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, patience, patience, brotherly ki kindness, brotherly kindness, Love is at the end. It kind of is like the icing on your birthday cake, you know? It's the thing that we need to be seeking after. And ladies, notice here in Peter, Peter doesn't just say love. He says we need to have fervent love for each other. Does this 
bring your mind to something we've already had this year. Remember we already had this in chapter 1. I know you've slept since then. Chapter 1, verse 22, do you remember that? When he said, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another, what? Fervently. Remember what we, we learned way back then, months ago, what fervently means? It means to be stretched out, like stretch your neck. It's like those that are running in the race and they, you've seen them, well, I, I haven't actually seen them, but I know that they, they stretch out so they can finish, you know, first. And that's the way he's saying our love should be. It should be stretched out to the max, to the limit. We should be willing to be spent and spent again for others. Our love should be fervent. And ladies, notice this love is among themselves for one another. He says, have fervent love for what? For one another, for each other. And then he gives a reason why we are to love each other. Notice what he says. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Now, what does this mean? Well, there are some strange ideas about this verse, so let's look very carefully at it, okay? The word cover means to conceal or hide, okay? The word cover means to conceal or hide. The word multitude, when it says a multitude of sins, it means a large number or a bundle, a bundle of sins. And ladies, Peter knew the idea of a bundle. Remember, he asked the Lord in Matthew 18, 22, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven, maybe seven times? And remember what Jesus said? No, Peter. How about 70 times seven? How about 490 times, Peter? Ladies, have any of you ever had to forgive someone 490 times for the same offense? That's a lot of time. That's a bundle, right? And so Peter says, love covers a multitude of sins. And Peter isn't the only one who writes about this. Proverbs says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers sins, Proverbs 10, 12. Proverbs 17, 9 says, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. And James even ends his epistle with this, let him know who he who turns a sinner from, his, from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. So what's Peter saying? Well, most of us have heard the phrase, love is blind. That's true, isn't it? I mean, love certainly blinds us to the faults of others, right? I remember when I met Doug Heck, even before, I, before we had that conversation in the school cafeteria, I could not see one of his faults. I mean, not one. You know, I mean, I thought he was the best thing since sliced bread, you know. And then we got married. I don't know what happened, you know. And then those little things that, you know, kind of started irritating me just magnified. In fact, it's funny sometimes we'll be doing premarital counseling and I try to warn the young fiance, you know, like, you know, I, I know you got starry eyes right now, but just wait. And sometimes they'll come back, yeah, you tried to tell me. I didn't listen to you. But it just goes right over their head. Why? Because they got starry eyes. You know, they don't see their faults. In fact, one man describes it like this. In your local church, there's Ann, who doesn't know about hygiene, and frankly, she's quite smelly. And then there's Billy, who wears you out with his incessant talking. If, if these are these of your names, I'm not calling them out. This is somebody else's. <laughs> Kathy is unspiritual. Don doesn't get along with Evelyn. Fred treats his wife badly. Jean is a teenager who never knows how to act with courtesy and discretion. Hillary grumbles. Irene has a different set of interests and values. She won't even come to Tuesday night Bible study. And then there's Kevin, to be sure, who's really quite saintly, but rather drab as a person. And so it goes on. None of them is very easy to love at full stretch. And yet we're commanded to do so, right? And by the way, this writer goes on to add that he's probably on somebody's list as well as a difficult person to love. And I've told you this before. Sometimes Doug and I will be talking about certain family members that we have in, either in his family or my family. And, you know, they're so weird. They do this. And then we kind of start laughing. We go, you know what? They're probably sitting in their living room right now talking about Doug and Susan Heck and how weird they are. And we are weird. But that's the idea. We need to learn to what? Love each other. We're all different. We all have quirks. And love covers a multitude of sins. Now, ladies, listen to very carefully what Peter is saying. We should be forgiving. We should be patient with each other. We should accept each other's faults, 
right? And ladies, Peter sure knew about this. Remember when the Lord asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? You know, he could have said to Peter, you don't love me. Are you kidding me? You don't love me. You denied me three times. I even told you you were going to deny me three times. You don't love me. But you know what? Jesus' love for Peter covered his sins, right? He didn't bring it up to his face. When he said, Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, hey, don't you remember that time you denied me in the courthouse? In fact, you cursed. He didn't say that. He covered his sin. And ladies, I'm sure as Peter write, wrote these words, he thought about that. Fervent love for each other. Ladies, when we truly love each other, we will not publish each other's sins. We will cover them. In fact, where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion. Every action is liable to misunderstanding. And conflicts abound to Satan's perverse delight. You know, how much gossip would we eliminate if we truly loved each other? and covered one another's sins. The person that doesn't love others the way Christ would have them to is often critical and very judgmental. Now, let me say, because I know you're going to go away thinking, well, wait a minute. Let me say, love does not cover or conceal sin when the sinner goes on sinning. This is really reading into the text of what Peter is saying here. That's Jesus' point in Matthew 18, right? If your brother sins, you what? You go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, right? Just two of you. If he hears you, you've won your brother. If not, and the Greek there, ladies, is you keep going back. You keep going back. You just don't go one time. You keep going back and appealing to him. Listen, brother, you know, I came to you two or three weeks ago, and I still see this sin in your life. You need to repent of the sin. You keep going back. And if he doesn't hear you, then that's when you bring in a couple more witnesses. And you know what Matthew 18 says. But ladies, that's if a person goes on sinning. But when repentance occurs, then we do what Jesus has said. What? Right? We cover. In fact, you'd be surprised. I've been a pastor's wife now for 45 years. And uh, most of church disciplines stop at the first stage. You'd be surprised how many people we have to go to, tell them their fault between us, and it stops right there. And that's the whole idea, right? It stops, and you don't go and publish that to other people. It's supposed to be a private matter. Ladies, we don't keep records of wrongs done to us. I would also say one thing as a pastor. I'm going to throw this in even though it's not in the text, but I'm a pastor's wife, so I can do that, right? And besides, I have the podium. But, uh, you know, as a pastor's wife, I would really encourage you, you know, when you have a problem with someone in the church, go to them privately and take care of it. You don't need to Call me on the phone. Tell me about it. Because, you know, really what you want me to do is tell Doug about it, so he'll take care of it. But, uh, you know, follow the steps in Matthew 18. In fact, when you hear of someone's sin, what's your first reaction? Do you call a friend? Do you think the worst of the person? Do you call them to see if what you heard is really true? Do you expect the best? Do you want to protect them from further exposure? Are you willing to confront sins when necessary and help the person? How you react to such things really shows the quality of your love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Ladies, when we think about the return of our Lord, then we sure, certainly should be focusing on loving the brethren. In fact, you know what the writer to the Hebrews says? And let us consider one another unto what? Stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as we see what? The day approaching. Before the Lord returns, we should be together more and more. Ladies, as the end of the age winds down, we must be about loving each other more. We're going to need each other. I think about right now what's happening in other countries. I think about what's happening in Canada. And you know what? When a group of Christians is persecuted, we need to be together. We need to love one another more and more and we need that time to encourage each other so peter says while we wait for his return love each other stay clear-headed and be alert in prayer the end is at hand and when it comes what will you have done for the glory of god so what should we be doing while we're waiting for the lord to return what are you doing while you're waiting for the lord to return 
Are you sitting up late to watch the latest tragedy in our nation and becoming hysterical? Or are you working on having a level head and being sober-minded? Are you worrying about what will happen to those you love who will be left behind? Or are you spending that time in prayer for them? Are you stirring up trouble and holding grudges? Or are you loving others to the maximum? Now, I don't know what you believe concerning the end times. You might be a post-millennialist, all millennials, pre-millennialist. You might be post-trib, mid-trib, pre-trib, or you may be none of the above. You may be a pan-millennialist. It's all going to pan out. That's what I am. And believe me, I'm not trying to prove a system, but I am trying to encourage you. You know, the whole idea of the Lord's return is to what? Be ready. Be ready. Watch. As one man said, here's what you don't do. You don't whip up a white robe and buy a helium-filled balloon with angels painted all over it. And if you're a Cal in California, don't quit work and move to Oregon for fear that you'll miss him because of the smog. And for goodness sake, don't try to set the date because of the signs of the times. But do occupy till he comes. Ladies, the fact that the Lord is coming should motivate us to live holy, right? We should live soberly. We should live righteously. We should be watching with an attitude of prayer. We should be loving each other fervently. And we are going to be, as we're going to see next time, we should be using our spiritual gifts. Ladies, we should love each day as if it were our last day and live each day as if it were last because it might just be, right? In fact, on the way here, Doug and I were talking about things. He says, now if I die, and I said, what do you mean if you die? I could die before you. You don't know when you're going to die. I don't know when I'm going to die. Today could be our last day, right? We do not know. Now, maybe for some of you, you are like I was, as I mentioned in the beginning of this lesson. Maybe you are terrified about the fact that the Lord's going to return. Maybe you don't want to talk about it. Maybe you get weak in the knees like I did. Sometimes I'd feel like I was going to throw up. <laughs> maybe you can't share in the excitement when people talk about the Lord's return. And so perhaps the issue with you is that you are like I was. You're not ready to meet the Lord. Ladies, if your life is not consistent with, with your faith, then the coming of the Lord will naturally be a dreaded event for you to face. If you're not ready to go, then get ready. Do not wait. Today, tonight, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not put off committing your life to his lordship, as you may find yourself looking back and not up. And then, my friend... It will be too late. Thank you for watching Susan Hex with the Master YouTube channel. I am Pam Sheehan. Susan is my friend and mentor, and I tape, edit, manage Susan's YouTube channel. I can attest that Susan loves bringing the Word of God to the women of God in order to help us grow in our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to be part of this growing group of growing women, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel, hit that bell to be notified when we post new content, and please feel free to share this video with your friends and your family. And finally, clicking that thumbs up is always appreciated. If you would like to financially support this ministry, please go to Susan's webpage at www with the master all one word dot org at the top of the page is a pink donate button that will take you to our church's homepage grace community church of tulsa this is where susan's ministry receives elder oversight to donate to susan click on the drop down menu in the to box and select with the master susan heck then continue to complete the form and follow the prompts. Your gift to Susan will help support this ministry in its goal of blessing women with the eternal words of our living God. Thank you for watching.